Can you tell us your name and where you live now? Uh, my name is Roberto Mestas and I live here in San Pablo, which is a community just just to the east of here. <laughs> <laughs> where did you grow up? I grew up in San Pablo originally. My fondest memories is uh, I had two of them. If it relates to my career and being an artist, uh, one of them is when I was uh, helping with the acequias and cleaning the ditches in the in the early spring. You know when they go out there and clean. I was probably about ten or eleven years old, and in the the middle of the day we had gotten to the the road that goes to La Valley and. There was an old man sitting on the side of his house on, on the porch. And we broke for lunch and I was curious to see what he was doing because he looked like he was busy doing something. Well, he was carving. He was a santero. And man, that struck a, a lot of interest to me. And uh, I kind of wanted to learn how to do what he was doing to carve. So I asked him if he would teach me. So he came. I came back after that day of cleaning ditches, and he handed me a piece of wood and a really, really sharp knife, and taught me how not to cut myself to begin with, because that's a first lesson is the safety, and and when you're using tools, especially sharp ones, and when you're 11 years old, you know, uh, sometimes uh, those tools don't have respect for <laughs> for you, and the other. I was probably about the same age, and uh, I had gone to the neighbor's house to play with my friends, and they were about my age, but there was an older brother that was in college at the time, and he had made, he had done a painting of his grandfather, which was hanging on the entrance of, the, of their home, and I was in such awe with his painting that I, I couldn't believe that anybody had that ability to, to paint. And I was extremely curious of, of, of uh, about the painting and the guy who painted it. And I remember the father being so proud. He goes, my son did this. And he's going to be a great artist one day. And to this day, he still, he still does painting every day. And some of you know him. Some of you don't. But he created the mural that's on the north side of the Jacarez Gallery, which is our gallery down the street. His name is Carlos Sandoval. So I, be, I befriended him later in life because he was gone, you know, he was in the military and he had gone to the Pittsburgh Art Institute and uh, I don't think he's ever done anything else but be a painter. You know, he was by nature truly an artist. A Santero is a, a person that carves saints that either for personal use or for churches, but there were usually uh, little wooden burritos that were made and when the settlers first came to this country, you know, uh, Europe, from Europe and Spain and Italy or wherever they came from. Uh, they didn't have the luxury of bringing those saints from the churches with them because of their religion. So there were people here that took on that, the place of those people who could, you know, take the place of the artisans. Of course, most of them were artists. That's why they all look so crude most of the time. So Santero is somebody who creates wooden replicas of saints that you see in like moradas and churches and stuff, real old ones. I'm, my parents were from here, my great, great grandparents were from here. Uh, San Luis, you know, was uh, settled 165 years ago. And a lot of us have descendants to those first people that came to San Luis. And so my connection is it's been a place where the original settlers first came to San Luis and, and, and settled here, and I'm a descendant of one of those settlers. I wanted to be a lot of things, but art was always in my mind. I went to school to be an engineer. Uh, I wanted to be a physicist at one time, took a lot of chemistry. But all in all, I was always in the art room. I would study physics in the art room, believe it or not. But you see, I keep growing as an artist. Every day brings on a new challenge, every day brings on a new idea. And any time, you know, I move on from the last one, so I don't have a favorite. It's kind of like, like asking a parent, 
that has 12 children, which one's your favorite? And they're all in front. You know, what are you going to say? My heart is here. They, they all are a reflection of what I am or what I do at the time. But the next one's just as important, if not. What I'm working on is what I, what I enjoy doing. I, I would suggest that if, if, you, if you're a budding artist and you're truly an artist, and myself, I would recognize that from when you're three or four years old. Budding or not, uh, an artist uh, is that. It's not something you make, it is something that you become and you are. And, but if, if you want to really be an artist, you got to work hard. You got to be diligent and you got to, there's studio time and that is sacred. You know, when you're in the studio, you're, you're creating. If you have friends over, you're still creating. If you have people over, you're still making your stuff. You're surrounded by your, your art. And you think all this came from just, uh, well, it's just a hobby. And a lot of people think it's a career, it's a job. But when I retire, I want to be an artist. <laughs> oh wait, I retired a long time ago. So, and I made that decision. I had the ability and, and the will to make that decision, but I knew I had to work very hard. So you had to work very hard. And as, as a Hispanic, or in our culture, you gotta work twice as hard. But that's what makes us incredible. Because then we have a lot more to give. My mom told me once, he goes, to get an even footing in this world, you have to work twice as hard as your white counterpart. You're going to have to prove yourself to be better in ability and uh, knowledge. Because they're going to give you, they're, they're, they're given the first opportunity for everything. you got to fight for yours. you got to earn it. So, but if you do that, it comes to you. I, be, I believed her. You know, it, it's, it's true. I go, when you leave the valley, I'll tell you what, nobody gives you anything. You have family to support you here. Once you leave, you don't. The support's gone. You're on your own. And you better well know what you're doing, what you're talking about, and most of all, what you really want. As an artist, when you receive a commission, and a commission is an opportunity to do a job, I saw it as two things. As a, being that I'm an artist, I was able to go to be able to make a living at what I do. But also I saw it as, as, as a great stepping stone to my further my career as a whole. I was only 28 years old when I got that commission. And to get a commission of that size when you're that young, you already have to have, you know, a focused idea of what you want to do and what, you're, what you did. I was already, I, I claimed to already be good at what I did then, but I only got better. My parents are gone, but yes, they spoke Spanish. I, my first language was Spanish. You know, the base of uh, many of our cultures are, are Latin-based. So if you could speak Spanish, you could travel, and most people will understand what you're talking about. You know, Because if you're not in the United States and you're in, in Italy, in Spain, anywhere in Europe, most people understand Spanish. So South America, guess what? Uh, you're better off if you know Spanish than, than you are other languages if you're, if you're gonna travel abroad. I'm not saying that Chinese isn't the, the next one that you should learn, but Spanish is the language that I grew up with. And you know, it also transposes into understanding other languages. Uh, a good example is when I was in college, I was in uh, ceramics, I was throwing some pottery and there was a group of guys that had come in from Saudi Arabia that were taking the same class. They were, they were studying art, but they were wanting to get their masters. And there was about four or five of them that were from Saudi Arabia, and they're chabbering away. One day I'm in the room throwing a pot, and um, they're talking, and they're, 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 they're doing their own thing, I'm doing my own thing, I'm just there. And as they're talking, I cracked up laughing, and one of the guys says, they stopped cold. They said, do you understand what we said? And I go, yeah, why? And they stopped because they realized that I, I was starting to understand them when they were speaking Arabic. And the older one of the, of the four guys says, are you a descendant of, of the Spanish 
of the Spanish uh, conquistadores or the people that came here? And I said, yeah. And he goes, you understand Spanish? And he goes, yes. He goes, you know, you understand that the Moors were in Spain for 800 years. A lot of the words got intermixed. So a lot of the words in Arabic, believe it or not, are Spanish words. And if you want to Google that and, and, and see the differences between Spanish and Arabic, it's almost the same. So ironically, I started to understand it. <laughs> Can't speak it, but I can understand what they were saying. So Spanish is a good language to have as a foundation for understanding other languages. One of the ways a country can conquer another is by taking away th several things. Language is one, culture is another, and religion. When the, when the Spanish came here, what did they do? First thing they do is try to change the religion. They try to change their culture and then change their language. I was in fourth grade when I went to school in Chama, which is a little community up here. There was still a school there. One of the rules was we weren't allowed to speak Spanish, otherwise we got suspended. All of us spoke Spanish. We all grew up with that language. It was being taken away from us in the schools. And I think it started way back then, and I think and then the irony is, now you go to college, you have to have a second language. What, what craziness, huh? But uh, I think they started losing the language because it was starting to be taken away from us. It wasn't something that was, you know, desired. Well, my, my uh, opinion in the Sony mind is by losing your, your, your Spanish language, is losing your culture, and thus losing your real identity as to who you are. And there's nothing to be ashamed about who you are in any, any way, no matter you know, what culture, what uh, last name you have, or anything like that. I think it should be proud of, you know, when people call me by something other than Huberto, and they say, oh, Hubert, that's, that's I, that's the anglicized version of my name. And I said, no, it's Alberto. And I stick to it. Nobody's going to change that. I'm proud of who I am. I was taught to believe in who I was and not who some, what somebody else wanted to make me. The next generation of Sangris, pay attention. Pay attention to, to the viejitos in the community. I mean, I'm talking about people even older than me because they came, they, they were here a long time. They, they, they've been in this... Uh, this planet for a while. Sometimes we look at them as young people, and and I, I remember that too. And I said, "Man, that crazy old man. Those guys have a lot of knowledge. They they have a lot to offer. They have a lot to teach. Most of all, they could teach you about your families. They could teach you who you were, who you are, who you could become. Don't take them for granted because they seem a little loco, but we all get there sooner than we want. <laughs> and." They become very cynical because they don't trust others, because they've been, you know, mishandled, mis, you know, everything else. But pay attention to what's going on around you because it changes quick, and all of a sudden you you, you look back and says, "This is what it used to be like." It was a happy time, and we see that in San Luis today. We see a very big difference than what it was, than what it was, 20, 30 years ago, or 40 years ago. I just recently got commissioned to do some pieces for Adam State College, and uh, they didn't tell me what to do. They didn't tell me why, uh, what they wanted. They just gave me a space, and I said, make something. <laughs> so I decided that I was going to make uh, something that was identifying my culture in, in some way or another. So I decided to do two sculptures. Uh, one is a series of musicians of mariachi, and the other one was a flam flamenco dancer. It's kind of like my, my doodle. <laughs> I probably did this in a half hour. It's got no faces, nothing. But it's an idea of, uh, of the guitarron player. Just an idea. And what, what this does is it gives me the line, the movement, the gesture, you know, how it's the, the motion is. But then, you know, I can't be this size. And I did a couple of them. I did the, the trumpet player and the, the guitarron to start. And then I did some sketches as well, some quick drawings. 
direction that I go. It's just a quick, quick sketch. Probably takes me 10 minutes to do something like that. And from this sketch, I can think three-dimensionally and create it in the round. So what I did is I took that and I made a skeleton close to this. But as I'm sculpting them larger, they change a little bit. So, but I develop them. So this piece here turned out to be, it changed a little bit. The gesture of it definitely changed. This piece here. And he's got no arms. Uh, the clay is back there. So there's, there's this sculpture in several versions. So once I'm done sculpting it, and I can see I have some work there to do, and uh, I make a mold of the sculpture. The mold of this is sitting right there in front of you. The mold looks like this. There's a mold on this half and the mold on the back half and I place plaster, it's called a mother mold. It holds this rubber because it's real flexible. If I try to pour liquid in there, it just won't hold. So I hold it together using the plaster. Then I clean the, I pour wax in it and they pour the wax back out and it ends up hollow. So once I have that, I then clean up and maybe change a feature. Maybe I add, add a little something to it or take away. Uh, from here and clean that whole wax up. This one here, I was in the process of cleaning up and finishing. Once this is done, I then make another mold around this. I put a gating material. It's a, like plumbing, and I make another mold material. It's called a ceramic shell. Let me let me grab one. This this is a kind of like a plumbing system right here, and on a smaller smaller sculpture. Now the reason there's a big hole in the, the nose is because when I do the shell, the, the mold is on the inside as well as the outside. We got to get it in there somehow. So that piece is cast separate. So once the mold making material is rounded like this, the shell, we then take the top and we cut it off right up here, turn it over and melt the wax out. So we end, we end up with a hollow cavity. The inner mold and will be attached to each other here so it holds in place, so it doesn't wobble inside. So the, the sculpture is then cast in bronze hollow. So we take what used to be this, melt it out of here, is no longer there, it's a hollow cavity. Then we pour molten metal into this and it, it's exactly like this except in metal. And then uh, we take the, the nose and we weld it back on and then grind it so that you can't tell that it was there. So that's kind of the process. It's very labor intensive. It takes about a week to develop that because we do it a little bit at a time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so in a nutshell, then, then we take the bronze and we have to sandblast it and clean it up. And if we go back here, I'll show you, show you some of that process. Anyway. <laughs> it was originally made to make the tiles on the space shuttle. So the space industry helped the art industry, you know, make a product. It takes about 10,000 degrees of heat before it could change, before it changes and doesn't burn. It's a fire resistant. Once we sandblast them, then they look like this. And then we start to, remember I, you saw the hole in the nose? I had a hole back here the same way. I welded the plug back in and started grinding to re-texture re the original shape of that that particular piece of artwork. The last step is we sandblasted down, we added uh, patina, which is a chemical color uh, process of coloring the bronze. And a patina is kind of like the rust on steel. You know how it gets rusty? But we control it using chemicals and heat. So here is a new project. This is Juan Diego. And with Juan Diego is a, it's gonna be a, Lady Guadalupe, this is my, my version of it. It'll be about like that. This is gonna be about 10 feet tall. Wow. I'm gonna make a big one. This is just a model. Remember I had a small model? This model is used for fundraisers and stuff for the large version of it. And it's gonna be in that church in Antonito. There's a big project that's going on out there. Mm -hmm. and 
to tell you how durable bronzes are to this one client of mine had bought one of my pieces years ago. His house burned down. The only thing that survived was one of my bronzes. It's right behind you. Ironically, the only thing I need to do is sandblast that repatina. You know, it's kind of scary because I'd, I'd go in there and I'd start to make all these different things. I remember one time the chemistry teacher comes in and goes, you know, some of this stuff, if you mix it, can make some pretty nasty stuff. And I go, I'm aware of that. <laughs> but uh, the irony of it is, is, it's way too easy to make really dangerous shit. <laughs> you know. And uh, there are some of the chemicals that we use that are pretty deadly. But you gotta know how to use them. <laughs> I use a lot of acid, uh, acid-based chemicals to make the patinas. You know, you put a, 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 a cup of acid in somebody's engine and the engine will dissolve. That's how dangerous it is. We, I make some, sometimes I make my own ferric nitrate. And when I do, I do it outside and, and I kind of like, hit and run, because <laughs> it's pretty nasty fumes that come off of it, could, could you know, I think, I think Saddam had used it on his own people on a couple of occasions, that kind of stuff. But the properties change, the chemical changes when you do something like that and you make something else. So I use some of those chemicals to do the patinas. And usually when I do that, it's just my son and I here, you know, we're dressed up appropriately with masks and rubber gloves, the whole bit. Don't touch or breathe any of it. So yeah, chemistry did come in handy. And and he would always, the chemistry, when I was in school and I was in chemistry, he goes, I know you're not a chemistry major. Why are you so interested in all these? And I said, I need to make chemicals to do patinas on metals, and I want to understand every one of them. What does everything do? And so I would read up on each one and see how to mix how not to mix, <laughs> and what got to use, and how to apply it. 